Welcome to Green Apple Books on the Park. My name is Carr Johnson. I'm the event coordinator for Green Apple. And tonight I am happy to welcome you to this 16 Rivers Press takeover. Um, <laughs> this is a, a launch of three of the press's poets, Christina Lloyd, Marie Silverstein, and Ellis Templeton. Let's give a hand for all of them. <laughs> like a really long time coming. Yes. So I'm really, it's finally here. The future is now. <laughs> um, it's happening. I'm glad we have some, some 16 Rivers representation in the, in the house from the press here. Matt, hi. Um, and I'm really glad all of you showed up here on, on Wednesday to, to support all of these poets. Thank you so kindly. Um, I have very brief business before I turn it over to them. Um, thank you for joining us here in person uh, and also to the people online. Hello, online audience. We appreciate you. Uh, we are broadcasting from San Francisco, California. We are on unceded Ramatush Ohlone land, and we hope that you join us in our pledge to turn land acknowledgement into action by donating either your time or monetary means to an indigenous organization each time you hear a land acknowledgement. Um, we have a QR code right at the back desk that if you if you take a photo of it, we'll take you right to the Ramatush Ohlone Land Trust website, and you can find more details on how to participate in this project of rematriation. Very brief business before we get to the heart of the evening. Now's a good time to silence your cell phones if you have not already. Uh, I would say picture taking is encouraged, but um, don't take a call in the middle of poetry reading. <laughs> um, please do check out our full event calendar on our website at greenapplebooks.com. Uh, we have a really great season ahead of us, including the event that you are currently attending. Um, someone, I, I'll mention it now just because I'm already here and someone mentioned it to me earlier. Michael Andache is going to be here oh, wow. in a couple of weeks um, for right where we are now for a poetry collection, which is why I mentioned it. It's his first one in 25 years and uh, we're happy to, happy to have him. So do check out our website. Uh, he's going to be here with Robert Haas too. I should mention that Whoa. as well. I know. Yeah, that's the right reaction. <laughs> Um, so two, two living poetry greats are going to be uh, here with us, and that's very exciting. So do check out our calendar. Uh, the restroom is behind me. It is available after the event and not during the event for obvious reasons. Uh, so if you need to know how to get there, do ask me. I'm glad to, glad to let you know. Uh, one note I will say now, a little bit in the weeds, please don't close the door behind you uh, when you go to the restroom because then we think someone's in there and then we have to knock and do a thing and get a key. Um, so it's easier if you just leave the door open. Thank you. Uh, we have books by all three of our poets at the front register. You can find them there. They so kindly brought copies of these new collections to us this evening. If you've been here before, you've certainly heard me say that when you buy books from us, not only do you support us as an independent bookstore, you also support the writers who put so much work into making these books, and then you get to have a book, which might be the best part. So if you are able, we always appreciate it. Thank you so kindly. Uh, I, I will say too, um, all of this is seating right here. If someone wants to get, if anyone wants to get a little closer, all of these bleachers are built-in seats, so do feel free to come closer if you want. You are welcome to. Perfect. Excellent. You're starting a movement. Thank you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first poet who is joining us tonight. Born in Hong Kong and raised in Manila and San Francisco, Christina Lloyd holds a PhD in creative writing from Lancaster University. Her work appears in a wide variety of publications, including Canadian Women's Studies, Miscus, Poetry Daily, Poetry Ireland, and elsewhere. Uh, Women Twice Removed, which is from Sixteen Rivers Press, is her first full-length collection, and part of the reason we are here tonight. Please give a hand for Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Thank you so much, Carr. Thank you, everybody at Green Apple for organizing this. Thank you, 16 Rivers Press, for all of your support. And everybody in the audience, uh, this is a very special moment. So I'm going to read um, from the three parts of my collection. The first part is a lyric biography of my grandmother. The second part is ekphrastic, so it's inspired by works of art. And the third part is more about uh, my transcultural background. So I'm going to start with a poem called En su tinta, which refers to a Spanish dish of um, squid, 
cooked in its own ink with rice. Yeah. En su tinta. Having sliced off its wings, cut its body into rings, she expressed ink from its sack to make black cloaked halos. She made me eat it all, the squid, the rice, the baby octopuses. My cracked lips were coal lined, my mouth stuffed with typewriter ribbon. And I should also mention that my grandmother was a sculptor and a poet. Um, so this book is dedicated to her. This is Esperanza, the relief sculptress. Shearing the copper sheet to match the length and width of the tracing paper, she starts to rouse Lapu Lapu's warriors to slay Magellan. Wielding a burin, she etches every sinew into view, quick to brush bright shavings from the writhing scene. She grooves the copper with a tongue depressor. Bulked up arms and legs are what she's after before pouring cement to warp the figures into stasis. Gummed to a plank, her burnished work lies at the ready. She douses bodies with liver of sulfur to bring out each fold of flesh. After rallying from the fumes, she strikes a mallet, hand hammering negative space into the pitch of gongs. Each blow stirs her men to a war dance. And there is a poem called Siamese Fighting Fish, and this is a childhood memory. So I don't know if you've been to a pet store lately, but Siamese Fighting Fish are always in little plastic cups, and they're also called betas. Siamese Fighting Fish. We zeroed in on the shelf cluttered with cups that kept them suspended in ounces of water. Their bodies shone like made up eyelids, all shimmering blues and maroons, magentas. Some fins were tight and tidy, combed lashes. Others drooped into tired fans. Our squirming attention knocked one of the cups over. A fish twitched in the spill. With the grace of a glass harpist, Esperanza lifted it up and placed it in the now empty cup, then trickled water from the other cups into it. She rearranged them all, adjusting water levels. No music rang out from her handiwork. The betas frowned, tuneless. She ushered us away from their shy, iridescent display, blood dribbling from her finger cut up on chipped rims. And since Easter was last Sunday, I have break-in, which actually happened on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Esperanza took her Dalmatian out for an early morning walk on Easter Sunday. One man distracted her on the street while his partner picked the lock and slipped in. I heard him shuffling her papers, flipping through her books. He took dollar bills interleaved in her epics, an heirloom brooch laden with pearls, our Cadbury eggs. I saw a leather gloved hand crack open our bedroom door, saw him survey my sister and me, dreamy in our twin beds. All I knew to do was smile and wave. And this poem is called Esperanza of Manila, which is inspired by the little prayer cards that you find in Catholic churches. Um, so this is an elegy to my grandmother. You who rescued a boy afflicted cat from perishing in the gutters, toweling its oiled pelt clean who rushed a hound to the spigots to wash away toad venom from its shocked mouth, who saved a blot of Dalmatians from the chafe of pet store chains and named them after Pharaoh's glittering cities, who tended to a canary in egg-binding agony, careful not to crush its juddered breast, who released a pigeon from its jailing grate, geckos from dosed rooms. O oh, holy steward, Minister to all living beings, pray for us now as we tend to your feral body. And this poem is called Saint Margaret according to Thurbaran, which was inspired by <laughs> the painting that is on the front cover. Thurbaran was a Spanish Baroque painter um, that has uh, never stopped inspiring me. I love the dramatism and the tenebrism of Baroque art. 
A virgin martyr in repose. Her crimson skirt obscures the devil's trunk. Gnarled tongue and coiling tail appear darkly at the edges. Everything, from the amber strands garlanding her milk-white neck to the gently held book and her bucolic hat, garnishes this pretense. Anything to diminish the blush to her cheeks, the shepherd's crook which pricked the devil, releasing her from the acid bath of his innards. No gore or afterbirth, no almshouse, no shamed laboring women. And this poem is called Sonographer. Waves travel deep into my body and you record organ echoes. You ask about my origins. Tell me about yours, how Ottomans and Soviets trampled your Armenia. We speak of invasion, occupation, as the probe skims my skin. The afternoon's acoustics are perfect. My densities pulse into grayscale surahs you study, absorbed. I hold my breath, imagining shapes your homeland has taken. Shadowed by the speed of sound, all boundaries displaced, I let you wade in sheltered waters. And now we're on to the third section. Um, and this is a poem called Manila. And the Philippines features prominently in my family background. Um, my mother and my grandmother moved there in the 50s and stayed for about 30 years. Manila. Where my mother and grandmother were brought to replace a daughter lost to Japanese bombs, a wife lost to rabies. Where we swam in hotel pools when our father came to visit, air con in his room so strong it burnt our lungs where red ants clamped down on my pigeon toes, wriggling in corrective shoes my mother couldn't unlace fast enough, where I marveled at the heart of the banana plant, the live body of the botiki traveling the walls at night, where a cane toad sprayed our poodle dead, where gamecocks lunged at each other in a pit, blades strapped to their feet, where I carried a bucket of snake eggs into the house, startling a masseuse rubbing baby oil into my mother's neck. And this is a lighter poem <laughs> <laughs> called Petit Genre. Um, so my mother, my sister, and I moved to San Francisco in 82. I was seven. My sister was five. We had no idea what cold was until we got to Tiburon. <laughs> Petit Genre. Peeling off our thermal undershirts, their waffle weave gray from the week. My sister and I squirm under infrared lamps that fail to heat this Tiburon morning. We dunk ourselves in lukewarm water, lather up and rinse, leaving a scum tub as we splash out for toweling. Goosebumped and spotless, we fumble with plaid uniforms, bobby socks and barrettes. Our mother picks thick black strands from the shower drain. We ride across the Golden Gate Bridge where a man driving beside us flashes handmade signs from his passenger side window. What's your number? Marry me. Mother shakes her head but laughs. We join in, giggling all the way to school. And this poem is called San Francisco Sevilla and the epigraph is Poetry is You by a Spanish romantic poet that my grandmother was uh, mad for, Gustavo Adolfo Becker. <laughs> the tour guide points to an invisible bullfighting ring to the left, to ships buried under Barbary Coast streets, but I keep looking for you, misplaced somewhere. Among the tourists, the bums, the fair workers dismantling makeshift booths, my ears prick up from steel frames clanging. I think I hear you calling out to me, me who wanted to unravel when you wrapped your scarf around my neck, bandaged a finger cut so deep it became a gill. I talk to you of waltzes, of wails, of anything in between, and still you do not respond. I unfold strangers' notes, 
try to make out their meaning, standing before Beckett's love-lettered tomb. And I have a few more. Um, this is called Connemara 2004. Um, so Connemara is in the west coast of Ireland, a magical place. Uh, if you ever want to visit, I highly recommend you stay on the west coast mm -hmm. of Ireland. Connemara, 2004. Remember how I gazed at mountains smooth and gray and backlit? How, passing soft cow eyes, crumbling cottages, you stopped to teach me what a fen was, and I snapped a photo of that lily that looked out of place. You led us to a dolmen where Dermot and Grania hid from pursuers, unraveled their story for me, our palms grazing the contours of their stone bed, our fingers touching. Remember how rhododendrons filled our vision, how I tugged at the bog cotton, incredulous, and the farmer shoveling turf, his eyes a supernatural blue. And I don't know if you've ever ridden on Aer Lingus, but that's the national Irish airplane <laughs> airline. Um, so this is Aer Lingus flight 147. The greasy screen flicked on by accident displays a two-toned arc spanning the Atlantic. Yellow marks the distance traveled, green the miles to go. Nuke, in bold, barges in on Greenland's sugared coast, already behind us. We hover over Davis Strait, Baffin Bay, the Labrador Sea, Bishop Country. Forests yield to rifts so corrugated and coarse as to invite touch. Their gravelly scrape against my palm, a distraction from the upholstered dark. I look away at the sheet of physics problems baffling a young seatmate at the gaping mouth of the man snoring to our right. Out of sync with the engine's roar, he keeps time with sporadic blasts of air. In a few hours, yellow will engulf green and will complete this downward northwesterly passage. No longer en route and restless in my aisle seat, studying mapped fissures, I'll have traveled to you, away from you. And finally, I have car wash. Uh, I love going into those car wash <laughs> machines. And um, I was reminded of a, an unsuccessful whale watching expedition <laughs> while I was in one. So this is car wash. <laughs> Let go of the wheel. Let the contraption swallow you whole. The suds cascade over you. Tentacles slap the glass, slobber, then swab your view. The salty lady, shearwaters feeding off the upswell. Coast along, you won't see birds tussling for scraps of seal, only ones fledging on the fairlawns. Russian pelt hunters, gold rush egg thieves no longer people their gulches. Hear the dryer's drone, buffers spin off droplets that dot your face and salt your lips. The guide points out drifting kelp, an orange jelly, he shows you a squid's beak. Touch its sucker discs. Map each serrated edge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can we give one more hand for Christina? Thank you for for starting us off right, Christine. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our, our next poet. We're going in alphabetical order this evening. Um, Murray Silverstein's collection, Any Old Wolf, received independent publishers bronze medal for poetry and was followed by a second collection, Master of Leaves. His poems have appeared in numerous journals, including Rattle, Zizaba, West Marine Review, and many others. He was the executive editor of the anthology America, We Call Your Name, Poems of Resistance and Resilience, a practicing architect for 40 years and co-author of four books on architecture, including A Pattern Language and Patterns of Home. Uh, Red Studio is his third collection of poetry and part of the reason we are here tonight. Please welcome Mary Silverstein. 
Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Green Apple. Lovely reading, Christina. Thank you. Um, thanks to 16 Rivers, folks. And Red Studio, um, this book was designed by Carolyn Miller, who happens to be here tonight, so I want to give a shout out because it's a, I'm so, so pleased with the way it looks. It's, the book is named after the Matisse painting of the same name, which will appears in one of the poems. Um, but I'm going to start with the um, epigraph for the book, which is the Polish poet, Wyszlała, I'm going to mangle the pronunciations, Wyszlała Zimborska, the great Polish woman poet. Uh, Red Studio, poems. But what kind of thing is poetry? Many a shaky answer has been given to this question. But I do not know and do not know and hold on to it as to a saving banister. So that's Jim Borska. And then I had the book, the book begins with a, a kind of a prologue that's called an abandoned epigraph. It's the epigraph I thought might be the introduction to this book years ago, but it, uh, it didn't survive the years of revision. Abandoned epigraph, and this one begins with another Polish poet, Czesław Miłosz, who taught here for many years um, in Berkeley, uh, and his four lines. Abandoned epigraph. You, music of my late years, I am called by a sound and a color which are more and more perfect. Do not die out, fire. Enter my dreams, love. Be young forever, seasons of the earth. Music of my late years. At 65, I thought I could hear it. Possible epigraph? I jotted it down, set it aside, and found it today, years later. But now, the word perfect, the phrase more and more perfect, bothers me. It always had, but in the excitement of simply surviving, certain things were left unsaid. Namely, it's fire, love, the seasons, versus the perfect, the perfection of their vanishing. It's like those fourth movements in Beethoven when the notes begin to realize they're at war with silence, a war they must finally lose. All that bombast, pure defense. Friends, poems can turn on you. <laughs> Fuck you, music of my late years. <laughs> I thought to myself, one spring morning walking beside the lake. But it's not the music's fault. Let the sirens sing. Lash me to the seasons like Ulysses to the mast is a better approach. So do that, please, muse. And to fire. And to love. Lash me to love, music of my late years against the specter of its vanishing, <coughs> lash me to love. Um, I, there were, when I, I started writing poetry earnestly in my 50s, and when I took an early workshop, and the, the um, instructor said, no rules, but three words you should have used, love, heart, and moon. <laughs> <laughs> but love, I already did, I did that. But I forgot to give you the dedication to this book, which is to my two of my grandchildren, for Sefi and Lev, at work in the red studio of the heart. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to do moon. <laughs> <laughs> when moon, I said, when moon, I said, be straight with me. Have I got a chance? Granted, she didn't say, oh, baby, baby. But did she or did she not? You were there. Give me the look. So, moon, I said, emboldened. The word itself, moon, is it, give it to me straight, still usable? No, nope, she said. Remember the fading flashlight you took to bed to read with under the covers? More like that. But the book is love. The poem, each poem, a mirage of light, right to remember right to forget. 
But I'll need words, I said. Are any words still usable? A few, she said, dumb down. Come to me like a baby. The latch, the suckle, the puddles of breath. No baby sings a song about the breast. And then the red, the title poem, The Red Studio. That's a Matisse painting, and it's a, it's a giant painting. It's a, it was a great famous moment in it. Uh, early modern, the start of last century, you know, maybe nine by nine painting. And it's, he steps back and he's looking at his own studio that he does the work in. And he paints the paintings hanging on the wall and the stuff on the floor and everything. And, um, and then it's been determined by studying the painting that at the very end of this composition, after trying many different colors uh, in different arrangements on the plane, he just washes the whole painting with red. And he wipes out a lot of the lines that are there that give perspective and so on. It just completely transformed it. And it was this painting I learned recently from a friend that Mark Rothko studied, and it totally, completely changed him as a painter. And the idea of this place being the um, location of the work, this is where he did the work, meant so much to me. The Red Studio. In L'Atelier Rouge, a painting of Matisse's studio in which he paints his paintings hanging from the walls, the cat on the floor of the painting is not a painting of a painting, nor, when I look carefully, is it a cat. It's a painting of a hand-painted plate. My head begins to spin. And I look at the goblet beside the plate, which looks to be outlined in white. But it's inlined, really, what appears to be outlined, only the canvas beneath. So cool, I think, lifting it to my lips. But it's empty, of all but color, the astonishing blinding red that all but devours the room. It's mystifying, terrifying even, learning to give and receive love. The color surrounding the man with his head in his hand and the woman reclining alone. He was nearly done, they tell us, with Latilia Rouge when without thinking he let loose the red. One big manic swing, a man reaching out and in, for where there is no more, more. Oh, happy accident, from which all our bright unhappiness flows. And that's uh, the first few I've read are from section one of this book. It's, it was organized by uh, Carolyn Miller, who was the book designer, also helped me organize the book into three sections. That was section one. Here's a couple of poems from section two. Um, this one's called Dream of My Father Demanding a Raise. <laughs> my father was a traveling salesman. <clears throat> my father perched on a rickety wooden ladder leaning against the garage on the phone with his boss, arguing over salary. Dad saying, sure, I'll get through this recession on savings if I must, but when things turn around, I've got to have a raise, 50 grand a month at least. He shouts into the phone, you know I know this business cold. What business, I have no idea. A dead salesman can't go back on the road. But it fills me with joy to hear him demanding, and we slap high fives as he steps down. You kicked his ass, Pa. And he takes me in his arms and leads me in a stagger waltz around the yard, whispering, it wouldn't have killed us if, when beep goes the alarm. And leave us be, I beg the God of waking. Can't you see he wants to stay? But no, he's gone. The ladder's gone, and loss is the boss, the big and final cheese. But what, of what, is loss the boss, if not happiness? That, that dream is probably from... It's one of those dreams that I was from so many years ago, but I, I, I just 
and the poem is an old one too, but I can't, I can't stop wanting to read it because it's, it's like I conjure them up again. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the end of this section, the middle section is family stuff in a, in a way. Um, let's see, it's a poem called Stardust. And um, in this one, I ask that you all imagine yourself as being my grandkids. <laughs> And also, I, thinking of this poem, this again, this was written a while ago. I'm reading it now with the with the war, the insane war that Israel is waging in Gaza in mind, because this tells a story of a different kind of migration pattern of, of moving from Russia, Poland, etc., into the United States and finding a form of assimilation here. Um, I don't want to go into it now, but that I, and it was not in the mood of the poem for me, but it's just, I can't help thinking about that these awful days. Stardust for the grandkids. It's night, and your great 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 grandfather, Boonham Silverstein, drafted by the Tsar and ordered to ransack the shtetl next door, leaves the family in Bialystok, walks to a port in Germany cons his way on a steamer, sails to England and then New York, where he hops a train to Chicago. His sister's already there. Picks rags and learns to sew, saves and sends for Sarah, your great-great-great-grandmother and four-year-old Morris, my grandpa Mo. Come to Chicago. All of it impossible, every stitch, but Boonham can sew, Sarah and Boonham. And here come the girls, Grand Aunts, Rosie and Sadie, Mamie and Kate, and Kate is where this is going. Your great, great Grand Aunt Kate, who zigzags her way to LA, where she sings and plays piano at the Kit Kat Club. Impossible, I know, but she's closing her set with Stardust tonight. That's me at the bar. This one's for you, she says to me, and to you. It steals across the meadows of my heart. And then a couple more from the third section. And the third section turns, um, I, I it's a more romantic section, I guess. It turns more directly to the... Um, I, you know, I sometimes think that, that poetry books, especially as the poet gets older, are love letters to the world in some fashion. And um, that no matter what they are, that's kind of what they're underlying. To find a way to praise this fucked up, crazy world seems an important um, task, you know, old age. And this is a, a, a sequence called A Difficult Instrument. And it begins with a couple of lines from a C.D. Wright poem uh, called Living, where C.D. Wright says, Our love, a difficult instrument we're learning to play. Practice, practice. <laughs> I love that. Um, and it's in seven or eight sections, I can't remember. And the, the pronouns switch around, he, I... You, so I, I, I'm going to give a few. I'm going to jump to section three, which is called What Mingus Said. Charlie Mingus, a jazz great, some of you know, double bass player. Um, the he in this poem is in fact me, but you'll, you'll see. What Mingus Said, true story. What Mingus Said, tree, tree, he wrote, and held the page up to a tree. He tried this at the beach with Bishop Sandpiper and in the hills with Wordsworth's daffodils, but really all he hoped to say was truth and love and light and hold the page up to the moon, but that eluded him. I'd like to show us playing, he wrote, the words, the world, and me, a trio, trading solos on a theme, world on piano, Words on drums and me on double bass, if you want to know my dream. 
A jazz journalist once asked Mingus, when you're up there playing, what are you saying to each other? What are you saying? You dirty motherfuckers, <laughs> said Mingus. And sometimes, I love you truly. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, and I'm going to wind up with a, uh, the fifth of this sequence. It's a, again, it's a sequence of, I think, eight poems. Obad, pandemic Obad with dying scene. Did I get <laughs> Pandemic Obad with dying scene. Zooming, zooming last night with friends, Julie mentioned a show, and we saw it. You said, wasn't that dying scene great when the guy comes to from his stroke and wants to kiss everyone in the mouth? Hold me, you said, when we clicked out. I did not expect to live in such an unusual time. Here is what this morning I know. Good orgasms begin in the toes. <laughs> Slowly advancing north, ever and shamelessly north. Praise toes through which the big thing enters. <laughs> the death count, our country broken, all that can wait. There's a starling at the window, a rising, almost summer sun. Carve it love in ignorance. Initials on a tree, it's dawn. And we're responsible, but not for everything. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you, Murray. Can we have one more hand for Murray? Um, I didn't know that about Charles Mingus. Um, that's enlightening. I hope it was enlightening for the room. Um, also, thank you for, uh, remind me the name of your designer, your book designer, who was here. Carolyn Miller. Carolyn, thank you. Thank you for shouting out the designer of your book, and thank you, Carolyn, for joining us, because book design is very important, and uh, we owe a lot to designers, or else we would have ugly books. <laughs> Thank goodness, we don't have ugly books, so thank you both. Um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our last reader, uh, Alice Templeton. Alice's uh, poems have, and short stories have appeared in the Asheville Poetry Review, Bellingham Review, North American Review, and many other places. Her work was a finalist for the 2020 Neruda Prize from Nimrod, and her chapbook, Archaeology, won the 2008 New Women's Voices Prize in Poetry from Finishing Line Press. She is also the author of a critical book on Adrian Rich's poetics and scholarly articles on contemporary poetics, cultural criticism, and literary theory. And her collection, The Infinite Field, is the third reason we are here tonight. Please give a hand for Alison. much. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. I um, want to thank the bookstore, Carr, 16 Rivers Press, readers, great, and of course all you audience members who came out. It was fantastic. We have over 30 people here for a poetry reading, so I think that's something to celebrate. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this collection before I start reading some poems. It's really about my navigating between my chosen home here in California and my family home in Tennessee, uh, especially as my parents declined and it was necessary to basically dismantle their lives. Uh, distance made this very hard, obviously, California to Tennessee but uh, especially the fact that my parents were farmers, and so they had land and cows and horses and outbuildings and you know all the paraphernalia that goes with a farming business. 
Um, not to mention four generations of family heirlooms in, in our house. So I think of this collection as both a celebration and an elegy for our farm life. All right, so I'll start with two poems that are about coming to that decision to choose a different life. And these are both, these both happen to be of sonnet length. I don't know if they're true sonnets or not, but we can call them that. <laughs> this is called Bearings, Bearings. A river stumbles out of the mountains as Pearl Street unwinds. Bolts of bright sailcloth rippling down rugged trails. This morning on the bridge, we gazed at water slipping over rocks, seething at every spur. In the afternoon, a skateboarder whirred on tiny wheels down Pearl. From the porch, we watched him unfurl like raw silk, surfing the yellow hyphens, his tight weave spilling downhill on the simplest bearings. Was that the moment you turned to me, speaking of reinvention, of risks worth taking? Streamers, ribbons, the narrows below, unraveling gravity's hold. Lesson. In a new month of this declining year, the crest of morning is frosted with fog, tipping toward north a degree more each day. Loose strife, goldenrod, bend into the path. The hobble bush muddies its palate, gives up its green for autumn's deep red. Last year, I didn't know your name, didn't see this distance as my future, barely questioned the passing of warmth or light. Now I know letters between us, confessions and dreams, how these late berries rushing to ripen make mad fruits of their yearning and how the body holds tight to what it has learned and hardest to what it might have lived without. I grew up in Memphis until I was 15 and my parents always had uh, farms that they rented outside of town. So I've always lived this kind of double life and I wanted to share a poem um, set in Memphis. This is called Youth Sermon. It's from my Methodist background. <laughs> What could ninth graders know about spiritual growth? But that was the subject we drew. We tapped our hippie preacher, probed your fallen mother, borrowed my father's solemn books. You favored the Webster's high-toned abstractions, the art of Christian living. I preferred the lowly lessons, a rusty bike half sunk in the Mississippi's mud, the twister I watched amble across the delta from my ranch house roof. The cigarette machine rang like pinball as you pumped four quarters in and I pulled the winning knob. God was everywhere then but mostly in the hollow things. Horse skull in the vacant lot, bullet hole in the sign on your street, the drunk well 
of your mother's eye. We were young, it's true, but they ask youth to preach for a reason. Training us for life, you said, for facing the roofless world. Envy, I said then, and still do, because we knew a love letter when we saw it. <laughs> T-bird in the junkyard, littered with diamonds, boot on a riverbank of daffodils. So I have a few uh, poems that I want to share with you that are about being called back to Tennessee to care for the parents. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, well, it's in the poem, so. <clears throat> this poem refers to another poem by um, Jane Hirschfield called Burlap Sack. Flight. After a poem taped to an office wall in San Francisco. A poem is, I'm sorry, a person is full of sorrow, says the poem, is the sack and not its sorrowful stones. I'm going to start over with that. <laughs> Flight, a person is full of sorrow, says the poem, is the sack and not its sorrowful stones. The page trembles in the brisk worker's wake. Whoop, whoop, whoopee, cries a siren on Market Street, and I am packing stones, not quite believing in emergency a fugitive called home by rumblings of a distant storm. Over the Sierra and Rockies, beyond the black sunflower fields, Tennessee lingers under a sucked out sky. My country crawls beneath my seat, only a day's flight, but I left candles burning years ago, and now, conflagration. Where the Mississippi and Ohio merge, I know the scene by heart. Tires, tree trunks, a half-buried drum on the barren bank, the river's awful insides coughed up to the shallows to take root again. Now I'm looking down into that big muddy maw combing the rubble I pearl around, the impossible seeds, the intricate messages of sparrows paddling on wishbones toward, then away from the deep. I fly to the candle, absurd bird, dragging my hoses, dipping my canisters into the current, carrying buckets, pitiful buckets, to the flames. Mm. Evening Song, Berkeley, California. Souls are en route to their rest this hour. I sit with my share of solitude culling books to lighten my load, at peace with endings on earth. A world away, the farm looms in me, smell of honey and itch of Timothy, the mare's muzzle at my neck, the sun bedding down in the neighbor's field as the distant highway moans. More than nostalgia, my life calls me home. Duties await me there. Burials under the brittle pecan where the grass overgrows 
and the gates are left open. Of all my belongings, this weathered map tells my ways. I pack my things, humming old hymns of release as dusk dissolves to evening. This is the hour creatures come close. The horses have ambled into the lot for the night. At the trough, they nose the water's surface, waking a little in the new chill. Now that day is done and the air has grown rare and precise. So I've created a, a character, uh, written a few poems using this character of the farm child. And I think it's a way to sort of get distance and avoid, you know, a, a, a sensibility of nostalgia or a misreading of that, that that is the sensibility. So it's called Prayer of the Farm Child. Oh God, O oh, sweet potato cut by the tiller's bent time, where is my hand's best work? They raised me, taught me dirt, the truth of giving out day after glorious day. In the horse tails of wet hay tossed out upon the earth, steaming under the sun, I saw each strand become itself and I took for my own the complication of tending one blade at a time into the fragile light. But, oh God, those oh singular vine, now that they're old and lost on the land, all that I know deceives me, binds my hand to an errant plow with ropes of tangled muscadine. And I will end with an ekphrastic poem, since you all read, read some. Um, so if you could imagine Andrew Wyeth's uh, Christina's World, everybody knows that painting, right? And you might remember that um, she's in the grass, sort of twisted around, looking back up at her home place. And... Um, she was apparently disabled in some way and had trouble walking, so that was part of the story. And th just want to say thank you so much. It's been so fun and really great that you all came out. Um, it's called World. The House of Many Shadows is sternly ordered now. The barn, a shape without splinters against the sky. My father's shirts on the line are no bigger than the pigeons I've watched from my chair each day, flapping to and from the loft. Mother will be distraught to find me gone but a painter needs distance to tame the eye. Yet here I lie, the ant climbing my shoe, each head of wheat its own gold light, my crooked, crutchless self astounded, bound to the earth's body without muscle to stand upright or reason to see as one who has dominion over beasts, birds, ants of the infinite field. Thank you.
Thanks for, for really bringing it home, uh, Alice, and with the title of the collection. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank all of you, all three of our poets. Uh, can we give another hand for Christina and Mary and Alice? Um, congratulations to all three of you. You have new books out in the world, and that's very exciting. And I'm glad that we all got to celebrate with you um, tonight. I'm just here to say um, a thank you to all of you for joining us. This is, uh, you are not wrong. It's so great to have so many people out supporting poetry on a Wednesday evening um, here in, in April. Uh, you could have been anywhere, and you chose to be with us, and I really appreciate that. Um, Brief business. We have books available at the front register. You can find them there. You can come find these poets and ask ask them to sign. They'll sign books. They'll sign books. Um, and uh, please do. If we have open bottles of beverages, it's your homework to uh, finish those for us. So um, thank you so kindly. Please uh, take a look around, make yourself comfortable, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.